it's quite a privilege to be here speaking to Tansri Asman Hashim, the, the group chairman of uh, M Bank, one of the leading banks in Malaysia. This is his boardroom, and I'm very happy to be having this conversation with a man who lives his life on the stage. So thank you very much for speaking to me today. Um, just looking at your boardroom, Tansri, I, I get this feeling that you enjoy life, that you live it to the fullest, that you make no distinction between passion and professionalism. By the way, this is not my boardroom. This is my uh, uh, lounge, visitor's uh, Your visitor's <laughs> lounge. Okay, but it already has your personality on it. So well, I think it contains all my uh, activities, all types of activities, outside of the bank. <laughs> were you always a passionate man? Were you, were you always a man who wouldn't do something unless you saw a reason? Yeah, I guess uh, maybe that's what we are, entre entrepreneurs. We, we have to be passionate about what we do. But you started as a professional, so you did your qualifications, you worked at Maybank. Yeah. Um, and I'm actually curious about the other person who worked at Maybank and who runs a very good bank in Malaysia as well, um, um, you know, public bank, uh, Tei Hong Piao. Uh, <coughs> were you colleagues or were you contemporaries? Yeah, actually, uh, I'll really remind him, you know, when, when, when uh, he, he applied for a bank license in the 60s. And... Uh, that those days, Tan Sui Sim was in finance and uh, only had to apply. So he had a long list of uh, recommendations for people, about 100 people. I was one of them. So I was like, you want to hear You owe me one. I was supporters to give you, they get the license. <laughs> right. But yeah. it was much later that then you had your chance and it came I had through. no chance. Uh, there was no license issued after that. So all my licenses were bought in the marketplace, market price. Everything, commercial bank, investment bank, issue, whatever. Market price. That was you and... Into my nose lah. Right. And that was you and uh, Hussein Najadi together. No. I bought out Hussein Najadi. Okay. <laughs> I bought him up. Yes. And at that time, uh, if I own 100%, uh, when I first started, it was small enough, you know. But of course, it grew bigger. Uh, the banking uh, sector, as you know, requires a lot of capital. Mm. So, so, so at which point does a professional banker uh, in a corporate setting sets out to become an entrepreneur and, and says to himself that I can do this, I can own this? I, I was an entrepreneur to start with, I think, because uh, I started with Bank Negara four years and then I decided to set up a practice. And that is, I think, my first very entrepreneurial step. Staying on your own practice, you know, with my wife as secretary and the office boy. She lasted only two weeks because uh, I didn't fire her, she fired me. <laughs> anyway, that's the, that's the first step, entrepreneur. So I had that entrepreneurship thing in me. And joining the, after that practice going to the bank was also another step. It was not to become, a, it was really a, a challenge. It was a, a becoming a bit of passion because I had, I was sitting on a the board there for about as a, as a non-executive for a few years, so I, I get a feeling about the banking business. It was good. And when I went into banking, I, I had to uh, cut my income substantially, but I did it, you know, because of, there, was, there was a passion there. That, there was a passion to build then, a business? Or oh, to, yeah, of course. At or the time, to, to build uh, the Maybank, that period of uh, 10 years I was there, uh, was a... So Maybank was in it, at that time in its entrepreneurial phase yes, in the 1960s. Yes. Yeah. So I think, uh, I know we, Maybank benefited from my <laughs> entrepreneurial thing. We, we really expanded those days a uh, great way. Then, of course, after that, uh, after that spell, the bank is then, then I've gone to the, the corporate side, the corporate world. And that was the other, the other uh, aspect which aspect was, it, which, uh, was which you needed to put certainty and process <laughs> which wasn't your forte yeah, it was a corporate world but uh, I had the uh, I had the banking thing inside I was, I was trying to acquire something you know, and I managed to acquire at that time the Arab Nation Merchant Bank in that regard anyone who is entering the banking industry today um, and what you saw at that time as being an entrepreneurial opportunity yes. it's no longer an entrepreneurial opportunity today is it oh why not why not i think uh, i think entrepreneurship uh, goes everywhere every sphere every sector every size even like now you know if i go in i have to go in on a bigger scale maybe take a take over a bigger bank for example, entrepreneurship still there. 
<laughs> hunger. Hunger. But I guess uh, some people say, but today, maybe the Portuguese are even more. On the other hand, you know, those days in the 60s, uh, those tycoons that we have today in Malaysia, all the big successful business people, nearly all of them started very small. You know, we were, the economy just growing, company, uh, country just growing. So that's how, uh, so you can look back, all these people, the big tycoon, the successful people, look back. 30, 40 years, they started all very small. Very but few. In, in those days, um, the, the, the fastest route or the, the most obvious routes were property, um, you know, property related development, trading. And very few people understood banking or financial services, and even fewer Malays were in banking financial right. services. <coughs> so, what was it, what was it about you special that you, you saw this? Is, is that, yourself as a person or is is that uh, an upbringing that that gave you insights into you know what you saw uh, not really i think my my training as a chartered accountant i am i am a financial man when i started came back 21 years old so i was exposed to the financial sector straight away trained first for such and then in central bank for 4 years and then in may bank so and then of course in your banking business in may bank you you're dealing with the corporate world all the time. So very familiar, very comfortable. And uh, then you, you, you start to think, oh, what, what can, I'm very comfortable at uh, running, running financial institutions. So I said, okay, let's get one. So once I got into the investment bank, for example, uh, automatically I was thinking, hey, what, why don't I do something like marine banking, you know, build it into a conglomerate. And that was the, if that was the thought, that would take me my lifetime. Mm. So, but that was it. Mm. Uh, that was the the vision. That was the passion. I was building it. Mm. That yeah. was it. And which aspect of financial services attracted you most, or which was your starting point? Was it the merchant bank merchant aspect, bank. or and what about the commercial bank, the the, the retail side? Yeah, uh, that was the last one. Uh, because that's where the rubber hits the road. That's where your funding cost is managed. That's where your your customer base is, is yeah, found. We, uh, I think we built up our group. Uh, the core was the investment bank. In fact, the, the last bit in the, in the conglomerate was the commercial bank. Not because on purpose, we, we couldn't get one. You know. <laughs> it was the last one. And unfortunately, we, uh, I got it just a couple of years before the, the big crisis, the big crash. And the two years we got the commercial bank, we started trying to, of course, we, we paid a good price for it. So we had to get some profits. So we, we were dishing out a lot of corporate loans. And when the crisis came... 97. It, yeah, 97, 98. It's the corporates that got hit very hard. Right. So we got hit very hard. <laughs> and then and then you made you even more honest and you, you, you pursued the retail instead. Or was that when you started looking at retail specifically more strongly? Well, no. When we had the commercial bank, it was retail. There was retail part. But right. Once you're in, you have to be in it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Look, um, now let's talk a little bit about boards and you know how boards disseminate uh, values. Uh, how would you describe your board and the people who are in your board and the fact that you've had the chance to to decide what your board looks like? You know, so what what does it look like today? <laughs> Actually, boards become very complicated nowadays. Uh, in the early days, uh, used to be you know. I, I put in people I know. For example, I was the one that, that selected the people. I know them well. And but uh, early, early because business quite not too complicated. Today, you really need to have people on your board who can contribute, uh, who really can uh, uh, have the right technical skills even. Yeah, technical skills even. Yes, I mean, uh, they are good in certain sectors that they can be useful to the to the group, to the bank. So, right. have to be very selective and very particular. And uh, the regulators uh, also make sure that you do this. Uh, you, 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 your directors have to be approved by the regulators in terms of inter the financial industry. Select them and then they have to be, they have to, you have to show that they'll be able to contribute in what areas of the group, you know. <laughs> So it's very, very particular and very special. Very so, so you apply the same standards for your board that you apply for your management team, which is um, meritocracy, fair play, loyalty. Yes. 
you know, well, we have to live by this. You know, we definitely. Uh, but I, I find all those things that I mentioned in our course ethics. We we are doing it all the time anyway. Uh, is, is no, is no, do you no do you subscribe to diversity, as in diversity in terms of skills, in terms of um, re, uh, reflection on on uh, perspectives, or yes. do you or do you do you tend do you find yourself um, going towards harmony, unity, uh, and and uh, and oh. a board that that sort of or in the in on the board, whether, whether it's in the board or in the management team, of course. Uh, Personally, of course, I feel that unity is the best. Unity and harmony uh, for for an organization to work well. When you have a disharmony, disunity, it, it, it can it can be very uh, uh, negative, and it could be destructive as well in terms of you have too much of a friction or or disagreements, uh, and this can happen. And sometimes the that can happen between the board and management as well. Also, not good. We need to have harmony between the two as well. So that's uh, uh, the thing to to really go for. Harmony and cooperation and all that. Uh, how do you, how have you seen the board uh, deal with difficult situations, difficult qu questions, difficult decisions? So far, have I've you found, have yeah. you ever been outvoted on the board? No, uh, I must say, he has never been. It's a little bit unanimous. How many years now I've been <laughs> always been unanimous? Uh, probably because if there is a there is something that is uh, not really dis disagreement all of that. I mean that's worked out in the end, and then everybody agrees in the end because you work out yes why do you disagree? This is the other point about it. So it's only unanimous so far. So far, <laughs> which is good. But where it isn't in unanimous, how do you work that unanimous? Probably if it's not unanimous... You do another vote. Probably you would not be carried. You know, you wouldn't be, you'd be rejected. But that's how you manage control. No, I don't think you can say I control it. <laughs> Nowadays, I used to be um, executive chairman. I miss those days. I call now the governance and the regulator require that the, the chairman cannot be executive. So you, you really don't control anything, and you have many independent directors. And nowadays, independent directors uh, must be independent; they're truly independent. So you have you actually have to get real views and consensus and uh, from the boards, board members. Were there any recent decisions that you found that the the board had to deal with a difficult um, decision? Oh yeah, I think we have. Of course, now and then we have some uh, some very uh, tricky one, difficult, sensitive ones, but we managed to, I think, do the right thing. <laughs> because I think also we are fortunate. We are very senior and experienced members on the board, and not only in terms of technicality, but in terms of uh, knowledge about the environment. Uh, how, how often do you refresh your board? Do you do you find that people come and go and uh, yeah, uh, now and we have a uh, every uh, we we change for every nine years, let me change. Nine years. And what sort of talent do you look for when you? When so you we try now to fit in the, where we have the gaps. For example, you know we we have a, a human resource. For example, you know so it's a. We gap there, then we try to find somebody who can contribute in the area. Or in the uh, technology, IT side, we have somebody who's focused on that. Um, Things like that. As a Malaysian institution, that uh, you find that a number of your peers have become regional. And when you yes, become yes. regional, uh, there the difficulty of replicating your ethics, your morality, your, your culture across markets becomes uh, an issue. You've not had much of that as an issue, have you? No, but we're hoping that FSPB, this code of conduct, we're hoping that it will be also adopted elsewhere, especially in the region. And why not? Because these are very fundamental uh, ways to behave. Is that being a bit too ambitious? Because um, there, you know, any number of countries in the region would want to have their own version of F F an FFCB or yeah. FSPB. 
No, no, he's not. Uh, he's not. He's not ambitious. I think this is the intent of FSPB to spread the word, not only in Malaysia, of course Malaysia initially, but spread the word uh, in the region and also overseas. But it's not so much the. They have their own code of conduct. I think yes, but we like them to incorporate our our fundamental things that we put out. If they adopt them, as I said earlier, some of them, all of them, that will be a, a, already a successful effort on our part. If we can influence it that way, but they can still have their own code. You know, but oh yeah, they say okay, this is FSC put out. Oh, I think we're good. We take incorporate. I think I suspect that because we're across the board. I suspect many institutions already have it in their code, in some form or other. Do you regret the idea that uh, your bank or the, the, your businesses, uh, your core business, financial services, has did not regionalize as quickly or as uh, as, uh, as as as, as uh, in terms of size? Uh, maybe maybe I needed to be a hundred years old uh, because <laughs> I started I started uh, 1982. Of course, my idea then was conglomerate. Uh, so, by the time I'm 70, I've got to the stage of uh, the Malaysian aspect of it. Uh, if I got another 20 years, maybe I'll do that, you know. But like now, I say a little bit too late to start regional. Is so, we are focusing on domestic. So, you, you are quite clear you want to be domestic. Quite clear. clear. But because of your shareholders, uh, you do have a regional influence coming in. So, uh, there's an external culture that's uh, affecting you or rather shaping you. How would you describe the play between um, the, the, the culture of your No, it's still, investors? we are still a Malaysian bank. I think the Malaysian culture is still the one that exists. Yeah, we want it that way. But having said that, professional skills, uh, you know, talent and, uh, and, and technical skills uh, are coming from all over. At the Agreed. Moment. Agreed. So how's that, um, you know, sort of coagulating into a, into a, into a cohesiveness? Do you, would you say that your organization is cohesive? It can be better because uh, we have we have uh, expertise coming in from overseas, as you say. But uh, it's an adjustment more on the people coming in from outside adjustment by them you know, because our culture is there, and uh, I think we have to work within our own environment. Final question: Technology. Technology doesn't respect any of this. It's it's changing the rules. <laughs> Um, and the rules are being written by your customers, and and they're not going to wait for you to catch up and you know be able to serve them in the way that right. they, they they want to be served. How technology savvy are you, and and uh, how do you think about innovation about destroying what you have created so that it can be recreated for the future? Yeah, actually, very scary technology, and it's costing a lot of money. You know, we spend hundreds of millions a year in the bank, but, but still, still we don't see the. We still got to keep up, and uh, things change so fast. And now you talk about e-banking, mobile banking, internet. Where uh, the ethics are very different, because yeah, it's about the customer now. That's right. I think there may be some new rules to be put out on that one <laughs> type of behavior. Uh, but certainly, uh, it's something that we have to be very alert about, sensitive about. That's why we, uh, you know, we, we think that IT is important for the future, and we have to have strong strength in that on our board as well, you know, to, to see the perspective what we should be looking at. But uh, you can see that uh, is moving very fast. Alibaba, for example, is doing banking on the internet. They don't have to be a bank at all. <laughs> and are you afraid, or are you? Are, are you? No, I think. Mm, yeah. I think I don't think entrepreneurs are ever afraid. You know. I think we look at these as challenges. This is part of the job. It's a part of the thing. It's it's banking. It's competition. Uh, that's how you look at it. Um, as the world changes today, you you find that um, a number of global banks, Deutsche, for example, as we speak, uh, is deciding to hive off the retail side. If it could, it would. In fact. At the very top, there are lots of investment bankers in, in Deutsche. Um, and um, RBS went through the same road, which is uh, take care, you know, build the top line income on, mm -hmm. the, on the investment banking front. In Malaysia, you would find other banks that, are, that have taken that road. I, I would say CIMB, for example, which um, has got more investment bankers leading 
the institution than there are retail uh, mm. or, or commercial bankers. How do you see this balance between retail and investment yeah. banking? Uh, how honest does an investment banker need to be to say to himself that he understands or doesn't understand uh, commercial banking? <laughs> Well, we, uh, yeah, I guess you're right. I think at the moment, it, what's happening in the world is uh, as you, quite a number of banks are, in fact, hiring off their retail part, you know. Uh, but of course, Malaysia, uh, most of us are all doing both. We're doing everything. And, uh, um, yeah, retail bankers are retail bankers, and you have investment bankers, they are, they are you know, different. Uh, and merchant bankers don't exist anymore. <laughs> well, well, the big deals are still being done. Uh, probably the big fee is still there. Uh, but but in, in Malaysia, I think like we, we have to look forward and see in the future how how we how we go forward. I think we may need to consider also doing concentrate. Uh, sorry, concentrating or focusing on some of our strengths, for example. And so, what what is the strength? What is your personal strength? Where were your strengths in building the M Bank? Oh, originally, because we started off with the investment bank, that was our our strength, the core strength, and we were the last to get into the retail side. So we are not as strong as some of the others on the retail banking side. And going mm -hmm. forward, do you think that that formula is still what you need to look uh, at? We may need to look at it. I think it's being reviewed, you know, all, all the time. Things change very fast nowadays. <laughs> You know, uh, the way banking is done and uh, uh, innovation. Let's talk a little bit about um, investment bankers, uh, merchant bankers, and the the ethics dimension that that they have in them, which is thank you for mentioning that. Uh, we like to come now to the FSPB. <laughs> That's your initiative, or rather, you've been put in charge as the chairman of this. Yeah, you see, the, this ethics uh, and professionalism and codes. This is where where I think nine, especially it happens during this uh, subprime crisis in the U.S. And that's when the issue of ethics and uh, values came in. But are you you you're not a man who likes to codify ethics. You're a man who breaks the rules. Who breaks the rules? You. Why? Well, you like breaking rules. You like breaking records. You oh, like speeding. You like. Uh, oh, that's different. <laughs> Those are different things. Ethics is different. Ethics is you no know, code of conduct, how you behave. It has values, you know. But as an entrepreneur, do you think that it can be codified? Of course. I think, I think we, we behave. I think we, you, to me, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, you, 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 you seem to infer that they, they, they're likely to, to break the code and be unethical. Not infer. I, I think <laughs> that they need that in order to no, create, no, no. to build. To no, 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 no. That's why the need for this our FSPB, the Financial Services uh, Professional Board, because uh, there is a need to, to ensure that, uh, at least in the finance sector as we see it, we behave, behave as professionals and therefore we live to a code of conduct and ethics of behavior. So that things like the, what happened in Wall Street doesn't happen, where there was actually cheating going on, false things, you know. So, uh, these are really values that we, sh we should not have. And therefore, uh, we need to have these uh, codes of conduct and ethics to ensure that, uh, so that uh, people, professionals who put out themselves as uh, financiers or bankers uh, have that standard and people expect them to behave in that way. And but then, in, you know, a rubber stamp is... In your career, how have you motivated the people working for you to, to have ethics? Well, you know, I think we, for my way we operate, uh, uh, to don't tolerate uh, dishonesty, you know, things like that. Uh, no tolerance for that because we are a bank. Uh, we have to sh prove that we are honest because people put money with us. You know, we have to be, uh, people can trust us. So that is very basic. But we, we're having this conversation in a country that is rife with, you know, uh, issues uh, that that you know that that go right against that kind of uh, behavior. So, what you but, know? By, by the way, uh, all countries are there. <laughs> it's a matter of uh, how 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 much. Even the U.S. you are telling they're the worst when you talk about the crisis. You know? 
what happened there? <laughs> billions and billions of... So that brings us back to, yes. to how you think uh, codifying ethics uh, will, will, will influence behavior. Yeah, so we, we, we are doing this uh, FSPB exercise cu coming out with a code of conduct, professionalism and ethics, standards that we expect the, prof the professionals in the industry and by, for us, by the way, it's not just banking. We're going across the board, banking, insurance, capital markets, and Islamic banking. So they have a s standard of, of behavior and ethics that, that will ensure. So across all of financial services, yes. which in your own organization, you actually have, your, you actually have businesses <coughs> in all right. of them. What would you put as <coughs> your, the, what would you put your finger on as being the most important um, you know, definition of ethics that characterizes, characterizes you know, someone who's in financial services? I think we, uh, we have come up with pillars, you know, four or five pillars, but I think there are very fundamental issues like integrity, you know, honesty, things like that. So what I believe is that when we come up with our the first one, by the way, the first draft's coming out on the 5th of May, there will be a 60-day period where we look for responses from the interest parties, and after that, we'll come up with an official one. So we expect that, because this is across the board, a very fundamental, we expect that more, maybe all of the elements are already in the code of conduct of uh, code of ethics of the institutions, already probably. If not, not in, not maybe most of it. So we hope that if that is the case, then it's wonderful. Then next day, we go to the code of conduct. The first is ethics. So then in, will your job be finished when the code of conduct is no, published? No, 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 no. I think, the, in fact, the next stage code of conduct, I think it will be more work because there is more detail about the conduct. And we will need to continue our work in terms of uh, uh, always updating, improving. We have to keep up with what's going on. Yes. But where does your own personal involvement in this, in this program end? Do you do you see yourself being you know being involved in it for a long time to come? <laughs> Just like I'm in the bank here, yeah, doesn't seem to doesn't seem to end. <laughs> it doesn't seem to end. No, no, whenever. But I think this work should go on and on because it is uh, trying to to ensure there is that standard of conduct and professionalism in the industry, and I don't think it should end. And I think it will continue to change and improve as things go on. New things come up, new tricks come out. <laughs> you 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 sound like a, a man uh, wearing an oversized T-shirt, uh, trying to explain something that was probably in you all the time, and now you're trying to have it codified and transparent and published in order that others can share what you share. Right. So let's go back to you as a person. Um, you know, yes. um, how do you, how do you think you've uh, you've influenced the the uh, culture of this organization. What you, wh how would you describe the culture of uh, M Bank? Well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe and especially because it's a, it's a conglomerate that's been mashed together with yeah. from different uh, acquisitions. But it's my, I think probably it's my own behavior or my own personality. I think we. So, for example, I've been building this up since 1960s. That's that's 50 years. Uh, yeah, 50 years. Or, or the bank is 82, so that's 30 over years. Uh, and many of my staff have been with me for, for forever. For so loyalty time. is yeah, an loyalty. element. So I think one is because I have uh, always uh, treated everybody as my uh, my partners and colleagues. Okay. Uh, I don't look down on anybody. And, and that is my the way I behave, and I expect people to do that as well. You know, not to look down on people and not to... It's a gentleman culture. Yeah, not bully people around. So that is one. The other one is a, a fair play, and then merit-based. Uh, I didn't really... Yep, that's very you know, good. No, no colors, no religion, nothing. On Purely on merit. So you'll find... So people coming into the organization, they can expect all that. That's why they stay. I think it's, it's just based on fair play. On merit, uh, no, no preferences, things like that. And what about dealing with um, complex organizations with forces outside the institution? What are the things that you would do, and what are the things that you wouldn't do? 
Uh, what, where do you have your own outbound markers, as it were, saying that you know there are certain things that we wouldn't do as an organization? <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't do anything illegal, of course, in, <laughs> and I think unfair. Anything unfair? This is where probably the the, the Islamic side or the Sharia side comes in. You know, I think it's a win-win thing should be always. I think if somebody loses, that is not a, it's not a, not yeah, a the concept not of equity, right? Yes. So, right. So, fair, fair play and equity and and meritocracy. Yes. Uh, meritocracy, especially, has been very hard to or very difficult to practice in a country like Malaysia, where um, you know you've got issues. But in the case of uh, uh, private operation like mine, you know, uh, in my own capital, you know, and uh, my own survival, and you're competing with the best, the best in the world. By the way, we got likes of Chartered Bank, Citibank, you know, Hong Kong Bank, and Playing all that. Yeah. So we got to compete uh, on the basis of uh, uh, performance, best performance, services, efficiency. You cannot have second class people. You have to get the best people. So to survive, you have to. I have to do what I have done. <laughs> what, 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 is, what, what is the most difficult decision that you've made in your career that you still remember and maybe you even regret because um, you know, it, 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 it's something that, that you wish didn't happen but it did and, and you, you, it reflected on how you think you know, or what's important to you? Well, of course, there, there are a few decisions where I should have said yes and I said no and I uh, could have made I could have made a lot Even of bigger. Uh, gain. <laughs> <laughs> an empire. But that happens, you know, I think it's, it's a matter of choice. Uh, difficult decisions. 97 crisis. Uh, I'm sure that you would have had yes, difficult points. Yes, I think uh, that was my most difficult time. Uh, because. Almost several institutions could have failed in some several yeah, days. That, that was really, you know, uh, it was uh, f uh, factors outside of our control. External actually, well, stock market went down. Everything went down, and the uh, what, how was your balance sheet at that point in time? Uh, oh, you know, I, my share price from twenty four dollars went to one dollar something. I should have bought at that time. Huh? I should have bought, but we all had no money. This is the thing. At that time, Malaysians had no money, and uh, this sometimes I feel is a strategy <laughs> to buy cheap things, you know, from right. Malaysia. Right. Because, so the people who were able to buy were outsiders, came in to buy. So <laughs> the most difficult thing that happened there was that there was a, a consolidation of the banks. And uh, initially they came up with six banks. And they call it the, the central banks. Right. And I were, we were not one of them. That's right. We were not one of them. Uh, we were not the smallest. But one of the smaller banks was supposed to to take us up. You know. Yeah. How would you have played it if you had been not allowed to continue at that point in time? Um, you would have had to call into you know into help all of your the people that you know that um, you know all of the uh, contacts would have been important at that point in time. Relationships would have been important at that, at that time, um, and compromises would have been important at that time. In what way do you mean? To, to make sure that you survived in, in that period, um, you know, in that stressed period. No, I think survival at that time meant survival of the bank. I will survive as a person. Even if I sold the bank then, I will have more money. Yep. I will do something else. You know, but of course, I didn't want to lose the bank. That was my thing. My, you know, I built it up and not the, it's, for me, it's not the money. In fact, all the way is not the money. It's Try to build something. Uh, you're, you're passionate about it. You try to do it as as well as you can. You know. And uh, of course, it grows bigger and bigger. But, but uh, it's not the money. So it was uh, wanted to preserve that. So that was important to keep to keep that. So very lucky to. <laughs> In fact, um, you've just you know provided another value, which is it's never about the money. No, you. In fact. Probably the most important to me was the first million ringgit. You know, I remember, uh, I made my first million. <laughs> oh, big deal. You know. After that, it didn't matter very much. Uh, you don't count the thing. You just build your thing. And actually, to me, it doesn't mean much because I don't change my lifestyle. I don't 
you know, I'm not that type. You still live in the same old house that you died? 30 years already, yeah. And uh, same wife or so. <laughs> so, so it's, uh, it's really building something and uh, accomplishing something well, things like that. And in that regard, how did you change, how did you, how do you think you influenced your children uh, in terms of what they did? Uh, how did you pass on your values to your children? I noticed that none of your children are in financial services. That's right. They, have, they walk uh, the other direction. They, yeah, they probably no, looked at you and they... There's nobody in the bank here to... to uh, I'm not handing over to my family, for example. You know, it, it, when I go, is is off. Uh, no, I try not to pressure them into doing what I want them to do, you know, I think so, so they are free to make the choices. And uh, more by example, you know, Asian parents, we, uh, you know very well, you know, we not more, maybe more now we talk to them, you know, but in the, in my father, you know, we never, we never, we never converse like, you know, we discuss things like that. But I think for them, yes, I have discussion, but not so much, more like, by example, how I behave. And if you were to describe people, and if you describe your children today, what would you say are the most important characteristics of your children? Oh, I love them very much. Firstly, I think they are humble. I think, I think they behave like ordinary children. <laughs> uh, they, they don't behave like they, they have uh, money or what, you know. Very humble. That's because you took them to humble places when they were growing up. I, I think we, I, I grew up humble also, you know, we, we you know, uh, it's only recently that, you know, we, we got all, but before that, I was struggling all the time, you know, building up this thing, uh, building up the thing is uh, a struggle. Uh, humble. Well, uh, that was... One characteristic. That, but that is part of the Malay character, actually. We, we don't push ourselves forward, you know, we moderate. Uh, it's, it's more the what other characteristics would you characterize your children uh, and you say that that defines them that that sh that says who they are ambitious i think more like me i don't think that was, but, but i think i think they they are pretty confident uh, but they, what they want to do one of my daughters is uh, miss nina and she became a uh, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> For Vox, an, an entertainer, yeah. Uh, and now she just changed and put the hood on, become on the Islamic side. Also, doing good things there, doing programs on religion and teaching, you know. Uh, very good. I actually give a lot of support. So they, they're very confident in what they're doing, which is good. It could be anything. You know, I, I will support them. As long as they're doing good things. <laughs> but they are. Do, do you think that... Um, being an entrepreneur by instinct, but having the, the training of an accountant is what is what is what. No, 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 no. Many of my accounting friends are still accountants. That's right. Yeah. So, but there are a few accountants who who break out, but <laughs> but they still have the discipline in them to you know, and that's where the the corporate culture, the yes. the the structure, the the process, um, you know, makes you an even better entrepreneur. So I think I'm lucky in the sense that uh, my entrepreneur. The entrepreneur part of me may be stronger than an accountant because if I was a stronger accountant, I would not take so many of these risks that I've taken. You know, you calculate, 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 you won't do. <laughs> you calculate so much. <laughs> but if you have stronger on the entrepreneur side, it overcomes the thing. You take some risks. But but that's where that's where bankers uh, are failing today. They you know uh, too many of them think that they're entrepreneurs. In fact, the problem there is the way in which they're incentivized. Um, you were never incentivized. You you were punished uh, every day, I, I know, until until you came out on the on the other side. But today, um, risk and entrepreneurship means that if I do it, you reward me like today quickly, right? Now, when you interview candidates for senior positions, uh, what do you look for in terms of? Um, you know the the accountability element, and what are you willing to give in order to get what you want? Uh, because you know, I think that people change jobs because of money today. Unfortunately, so I think it's not easy to get. You know, nowadays people are committed or passionate. You know about this, so, so that's what we look for: passion, commitment, accountability. So this is the real fault of the 
what happened in Wall Street because they were rewarded on a short-term basis. Everybody worked hard to... But you, but you can't hire people on your terms, on your values today. Yes. So what do you do? Uh, so you try to save the credits as much as you can. You know, and what do you look for? So you look for these qualities, as I mentioned. You know, the, the and and in the investment banking community, you're not going to find much of that. <laughs> no, I think it will be very hard on them. You, know? <laughs> you mean there are good investment bankers? <laughs> No, I think you have good people around, yes. I've been fortunate in, in the past also because so many people sort of stayed with me for so long. But good people not necessarily take you f further, faster. So in that sense, your organization wouldn't have moved as fast as you would like it to. Uh, as, as yeah, some you're probably right. Uh, probably I could have moved part, much faster. But I think uh, it's okay. I think uh, it's, it's okay. Uh, you, 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 have, you have to balance it, you know, where you want to go. Uh, steady, steady as it goes, you know, it's, it's also, also good. <laughs> I think for us, like me, I have to think long term. Not tomorrow, next year, or two years, I've got to be long term. So, but you've always thought long term. So yes, at, at which point does the long term end for you? That, that you then say, Okay, I've done my part. Uh, it's now time to hand over. And I, I haven't come to that yet. I haven't seen anything. No in... signs yet. Okay. <laughs> is is that because you're enjoying yourself, or is that because it's difficult to give up? I think I'm enjoying myself. I think uh, I'm in my element. I'm comfortable. By the way, it's not just banking. I'm doing. I've also got my other activities, you know, investments in properties, and so on other listed companies, but of course the bank is the, the biggest part of it. Yeah. But as you, um, as you look for investors for the bank and so on, is there a process by which you are exiting or realizing your profits or, um, or rationalizing your involvement? What's, what's happening? What's, what's driving it? Mm, but that is the future. And uh, of course I, I'm not getting any younger. Uh, but I'm also enjoying as I'm <laughs> going on. But I guess uh, at some stage I have to make a decision, you know, uh, to come out of it and really uh, take it easy or something like that. But so far I don't see any signs of that yet. <laughs> and, you, and you don't see the signs because you're enjoying yourself doing different things uh, all at once. Yeah, many things, I think. I also, because of my involvement in, in, in the bank, I get involved in other things like FSPB. I'm chairman of the uh, bankers or chartered bankers, things like that, or many other things. So that keeps me. Also, those things are, are very nice things to do. You know, it's, it's, uh, why is FSPB a nice thing to do for you? Oh, you know, if it can be part of a useful... Do you have uh, a grandfather's no. instinct in you now? I think I've always been like that. Even when earlier on days, you know, I've been doing these things. Not only in the commercial world, I've been doing, uh, I don't know, president of Friends of Prisons Club, like, all sorts of things. I've been doing all sorts of things all the time. So I feel that where I can do some good in whatever sector, you know, uh, that's why I'm so busy uh, doing these things. Uh, I do it, if I can do it, you know. So the thing that I want to draw here is that instinct to disseminate, the instinct to share, the instinct to, to, to uh, you know, to, to pass on um, the intangibles, the values, the, yes. you know, the, the habits. Uh, do you think you're very successful, even with your own family, if not with your, with your organization? I hope so. Uh, I hope so. Anyway, reading from the comments I get, it appears to be so that there are, you know, is by example sort of thing. Many of these values have been quite clear to them. And what does your wife think of you, by the way? Because, um, you know, like she was know quote, she was, she was, like know she was quoted a long time ago I saying that when it. she first met you, you were weird. And, yeah. and uh, what would she say today? That you're accomplished? That uh, you're still weird enough to be interesting? I'll never ask her. 
I was weird because I used to play a lot of tennis in Australia and my, I was a left-hander. My left arm was bigger than my right. She says, this funny guy. But uh, no, we've married over 51 years now. So, happily married. So, Are you the same man that she married? I think so. I don't think I've changed at all. And that is the secret, I think. And the other secret is that I think we respect each other all the time. Despite the fast cars, the fast boats, the... She used to, when she was younger, she used to be with me with the fast cars. But I, every time I drive fast, I'll be, she'll be pinching me black and blue, you know. And then after that, she gave up. Never, she never been in my car when I drive anymore. <laughs> so there's a mutual respect in terms of, uh, you know, what, what each is about. Yes. Tanshi Asman Hashim, thank you very much for speaking to us today. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to say something about FSPB. So I do hope that uh, people will support this initiative, which is good for the conduct of people, especially in the financial sector. Thank you.